What's up everybody? Welcome back to Make It Custom. I'm Carl Fisher and today we are back on the 1939 Zephyr three window coupe conversion project. It's a 1939 Zephyr four door sedan and I am cutting it up and making the panels to convert it into a three window coupe. So the last video that we did on this, we made a coupe door out of two doors and planned our suicide door job, which is uh, what you can see right here. This door is made up of the back half of the rear door and the front half of the front door and extended to the right length to become a coupe. So this video here is going to concentrate on how to weld that seam without warping the Jesus out of it. So stay tuned for that. Thanks for watching Make It Custom everybody. Don't forget to like, click subscribe, hit notifications. Let's get into the video. Rick just couldn't stay away. He's a crow to tinfoil when it comes to low riders. Anyway, while well, he's buggering over there, what I'm doing here is I just put the rear door back on because I'm about to cut these apart to match them up to what we did on the other coupe door. And what I want to get first is a profile gauge made for the whole length of the two doors to the quarter. That's what I'm about to do right now. I'm going to do the same type of gauge that I already did but I'm gonna extend it, make it a little bit longer so we have the full sweep from here to there before we you know, take these doors apart. Yeah, so I'm just gonna use the shrinker stretcher, try and give you guys a, a better look at how I do each one of those. Rather than shrinking a little bit along the whole thing and kind of guessing how much to shrink and where to do it, what I like to do is start at one end and I'll do a shrink and then I'll have a look down and see how close it is and then I'll do another shrink, and then we'll slowly just work from one end to the other. That is the technique, because if you kind of go a little bit all over the place, you could get gaps and not really know how to fix them. Like you close a gap here and a gap opens over there. That way, starting at one end and working your way to the other, you can just do a little bit at a time. So I've done up to this Sharpie mark, and now it starts pulling away. So my next one is going to be right where it starts pulling away. I don't know if you can see down in there, but right at the edge of the door.
Okay, so I know this video so far looks a lot like the other <laughs> video, but I promise it's a little bit different. So the whole reason why we wanted this profile gauge is because we don't have that information anymore. Those, that door's gone. So now we've got an exact profile of the outside of the car. That's gonna come in handy for when we're filling that gap right there. So I had to get it before I got rid of these two doors. So that's good, we're gonna use that. So where I'm at now is that I'm ready to fit these two doors again. And I'm just gonna reiterate how important this is to get this stuff clean and right. There's a couple people in the comments, they were asking me like, did you just cut that once or did you creep up on it? Did you cut it large and creep up on it? Well, if you set these two pieces together, this piece and this piece, and you slide them together and we eyeball this body line all the way down and we have the profile with our profile gauge across the surfaces, if those things all line up, and I mean perfect, as perfect as you get them here is as perfect as they will be on the car. That is a fact. And in fact, spending more time here fitting this until it's perfect. Like I'm gonna be shimming areas underneath and just trying to hold the two pieces in the exact spot that they're gonna be, in the absolute exact spot that they're gonna be. That is where I'm gonna spend the time because then once I mark this line, I know that that mark is absolutely perfect. So there's no need to creep up on anything. I cut that, I marked the line once and I cut the line one time. And then as long as that gap is super tight all the way along as I'm tacking it, I can guarantee that those panels are in the right spot that they have to be. You know, that is where the consistency comes in. So yes, I will mark it once and I will cut it once and that's it. So it's super important right now for me to take both these halves, make sure they're very clean in all the spots that I can get to inside everywhere and I'm gonna set them on this table and make them fit perfect profile wise and body line wise and then I will mark it I will scrub like I'll cut it and put them back together and then I'm gonna show you step by step how to tig tack these together and what areas to start with and we're gonna go over all that that's the whole point of this video and why it's different from the last one is that we're gonna get these tacked up and then I'm gonna show you the best way to weld those two pieces together that I know and how to finish them so that, you know, it almost looks like it didn't happen. So let's get to it. I'm gonna start fitting these together.
All right, so we are at the point where we can start tacking this. This door is pretty much at the same spot as the last door is. So I just wanna go over once again how I like to tack panels like this. And it's quite crucial that right now everything is lining up perfect. We've got this crown with our gauge here that we are nice and tight to. We've got these panels fitting nice and tight. Actually, this one's can be tighter. There we go. Look at that. That's what you want. You don't want any gap in here or very little because if it is perfectly tight in here, then the panels aren't going to move very much because they got nowhere to go. So what we're going to do is start by tacking it right exactly where it's flush and touching. I'm going to get a fusion tack there and I'm going to start from one end and slowly tack every couple of inches all the way to the other end. Now let me explain why, because if I was to tack here and then tack at the other end, then when I start chasing these tacks together, I guarantee you that one panel is going to end up higher than the other, because even if they are not perfect by a little bit, you'll end up chasing metal to the point where it's got too much metal here and not enough metal here or vice versa or whatever. So you have to start at one end and move this way. And what is going to happen is that as I'm tacking, tack, 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 all the way down, it may try and pull the metal tighter and tighter and tighter. And the way that I have to fight that, or the way I try and correct that, is that once I see that happen and that the metal in front of my tack has overlapped itself a little bit or got just a little bit too tight, is that you take a hammer and dolly and you tap the tack and you stretch it just a little bit because what's happening is that that tack is heating up and cooling and pulling it together and then that's making your panels come together tighter and tighter until they overlap we don't want that so to correct it as soon as you see that happen you just hammer the tack with a dolly on the back side and it will stretch the panel back out so that it can be aligned again so i'm going to tack beginning here slowly all the way down just making sure that the panel fits perfectly flush like run your fingernail on it get a piece of metal like you don't want the metal even a little bit one way or the other and once we get it tacked every couple inches that's when we come in and we start tacking every half to three quarters of an inch and once those are tacked every half to three quarters of an inch then we know that no matter what happens when I'm welding from one end to the other, those panels in front of the weld are not gonna misalign and be welded misaligned because they're tacked every half an inch or so all the way down. Now that is the main trick. That is the number one takeaway from TIG welding thin sheet metal is right now we need to make sure that this process and this step of fitting super tight all the way is perfect. And once we've got those tacks every half an inch to three quarters of an inch all the way down, then I'm gonna take my hammer and dolly and I'm gonna just planish it a little bit, like tap along all the tacks and just make for dang sure that this is flush all the way. And then, like I say, we'll just weld it. We'll just weld it and it'll warp. And then I'll show you how to deal with it after that. Okay, so we're doing all right here. It's looking pretty good. These are nice and tight, but like I said, we're tacking along here and it's tightening it up. Every tack, it's just pulling it a little bit more. So it's, it's kind of stuck here right now. So this is what I was talking about with a dolly and a hammer. I got the dolly, where's my hammer? 
Um, here it is. So this last tack kind of took it a little too far. Now I can't really move that area. It's a little bit stuck, like one side doesn't want to push up or down. And it's because that final tack went a little too far. So I'm going to put the dolly right up underneath this tack and just gonna give it a tap. Hopefully I can feel it right, right in the spot. Oh, that's not it. Here, you can hear it now. That's because I'm actually on the dolly. There. It's so hard to feel it. There we go. A little on this one. Now that has stretched a little bit and you see how I can move these two pieces now? It's just opened it up enough to put us back on track. So that is the trick is that when this starts to get tight, just hammer stretch your tacks and keep going. All right, so I got both doors tacked up every half an inch or so, trying to keep the panel aligned with a hammer and dolly, making sure that you know they both line up on the same plane. That's really important as we're tacking it together. So now at this point, it's tempting to just go ahead and weld this, but there's another step. The next step now is to just grind down any of the high spots where I've got some filler and then I want to hammer and dolly this seam once more to try and get it as perfect as possible. The more time that we take now making this joint consistent, that is all directly relative to how consistent and how good our weld is going to be. Because we've got a nice tight gap and almost even more important than it being tight is that it is consistent. It means that our heat as we weld can be consistent. It means that we can confidently weld from one end to the other without stopping because there's a variation in gap and we have to apply more filler or whatever. The more consistent this is, the better the weld will be. So it's not just about being a good welder, it's about fitting the panels as good as they can be fit. So yeah, that's all I really got to say about that. I'm going to go ahead now and grind the tips of all these off. And then I'm going to hammer and dolly as smooth as I can get it. And then we are ready to weld it nonstop from one end to the other. There might be some impurities. I might have trouble. Like it might not be perfect, but uh, that's what we're trying to do is be as consistent as possible so that we've got a chance at just welding it in one go.
All right, we're welded up here and it worked out just about as good as I could have hoped. I didn't quite get the entire distance without stopping. There were a couple of spots that made little holes that I kind of blew through, so I had to fill a little bit. And that's just, you know, whatever small inconsistencies were in my fit and whatever impurities that could have you know, got in there, I guess, in, into the metal from the backside, perhaps. This one turned out the best as the first one I did. And you can see the heat is just nice and narrow heat sign on there and, uh, and really consistent. So it barely warped, like there's a tiny bit in it, but you know, it barely warped. So what has happened though, is that that whole line has shrunk. As I'm welding it, it is raising up, like it's making a little hill around my weld as I'm traveling along and the metal is, you know, expanding from the heat and coming up and then, you know, cooling back down and coming back to this normal plane, but it has shrunk a little bit. It's like, but that's the movement I'm talking about is like it comes up and it comes down and like that's the movement that would misalign your panels if you were not tacked every half an inch like I tacked here before the weld. So there's that much movement. It makes like a little hill. So um, you got to watch out for that. This one, I did struggle a little bit here and I burnt a little hole here that I had to, you know, sit there and fill. But you can see just that, just that little spot that had a little bit wider amount of heat. You know, it wasn't consistent with the nice narrow heat that I'm trying to keep here. It did warp the panel enough that I have an oil can right here. And, uh, and so what that means is that this shrunk more than the rest of it because I added too much heat. There was too much shrinkage around there that now there's not quite enough metal between this side and this side to keep both sides up. I'm gonna pop it out so you can see what I'm talking about. See if I pop that side, this side drops. If I pop that side, the left side drops. So that oil can, a lot of you guys asked me about the oil can effect and it's because of, you know, a shrink or a stretch in the wrong spot. So we know that this I screwed up on and it got a little bit too much heat. So it's, it's shrunk a little bit too much there. So once we planish this out, there should be enough metal to relax this out and, and add the metal that it's missing in this area. It'll take that oil can out. Um, there's a small oil can on this door. I think it's somewhere right here. There it is. Just a little bit of one right there. And this isn't perfect. Like there's, there's a little bit of a wave going along here, but the next step for me is to once again, take the tips, any of the extra filler material that is on the weld. I'm going to grind that off. I'm using 80 grit Cubitron discs. They're three M Cubitron discs. They're purple. They're expensive, but they last way longer, like more than double the, uh, the other kind of discs that I can buy. So these are 80 grit discs on a three inch roll lock. That's what I'm using to clean the tops of the welds off. And then I use a, DA sander with a 80 grit pad on it to finish. That's what all my finishes are. Basically, this is what I use. I use 80 grit. If a weld's really tall, maybe I'll use, you know, uh, 36, but as soon as it gets close to the metal, I'll switch to 80 and just take it off with the 80, go to 80 grit on the DA and it's nice and smooth. That way I know I'm not gouging too deep into the metal. I'm always concerned about the thickness. Like that's something that, you see a lot, and I know it's something that people struggle with, is taking the wrong abrasive to a vehicle and, uh, and grinding too far. It's easy to do when you're starting out, but just be mindful of where the parent metal is and your weld. Try and only grind on the weld if you can, and there's no need to go any further than when you touch the parent metal. Okay, so now I got the doors flipped over and uh, I cleaned any of the high spots off of the weld penetration on the backside. And now the next step for me is to take out any of that sink 
and some of that warpage. So what I'm going to do is use a flat dolly on the outside of the panel from underneath and a shallow crown hammer and we're going to smooth out this seam. Try and get it as uniform as possible because when things shrink they tend to try and pucker in just a little bit. So we're going to try and get some of that out and any of the spots that I feel like need a little bit of a stretch I might hand stretch them with this hammer with the hammer on dolly on technique. So we're squishing the metal between the hammer and the dolly. It'll probably need it a little bit there. Okay, here's that spot I was talking about on the other door. We've got a little bit too much shrink in this area. So that oil can, we're going to take care of that right now by stretching this out a little. See that oil can is already gone and that's just by stretching that a little bit. It, it definitely needs more work but that stretch pop that out. All right so now that we've got the panel this far it could use a little bit more planishing. It's pretty good. I got those oil cans out of it. It's nice and tight. I mean, honestly, you could you could probably just call it good and uh, and give it a tiny swipe of filler. But since we're here, we're gonna we're gonna try to planish this out as best we can. You can go by hand using a nice shallow dolly and just you know a bunch of hammer hits using the spoon as well and uh, and planish this out. In fact, I might try and do one just totally by hand to show you guys that you don't need this machine because I've got it. I'm going to use it. This is our planishing hammer, our portable planishing hammer. We make them in a uh, 36 inch throat depth and a 24 inch. This is the 24 inch. And what's nice about this is that it's portable. It's meant to be something that you can bring to the panel. So I'm going to just open up the jaws here by adjusting this turnbuckle. I can open the jaw. We can bring it right right over our panel. And we can tighten it to the metal with just a little bit of pressure, really not much at all. And one thing I'll talk about as well is that the radius that I'm going to be using is a 48 inch radius. It's a very, very shallow uh, radius die, which means our lower anvil. This one's flat, but the one underneath is a 48 inch radius. You always want to match your radius to as close as possible to the radius of the metal that you're smoothing. So I've got a radius gauge here. This is one that we sell with the kit and uh, it's got, you know, half, half the radius is on there. 36 being a, a quite a shallow radius and this is even more shallow. So we went with a 48 inch lower anvil on the planishing hammer right now. I'm just going to go over it with, uh, you know, some light pressure and just kind of do a couple of passes, just smoothing it out. And then any of the spots that might be low that need a little bit of a pick me up, we will add a little bit more air pressure to hit those areas harder to stretch those areas evenly.
All right, so we've got this planished out. It's pretty good. I spent about a half an hour messing with it, but um, it did come out pretty good. We could probably get it even a little bit more. I can feel a very slow kind of, a very, very slight slow something in there. But um, I'm really happy with it. I think it turned out amazing. Like that weld seam is just gone. That is the planishing hammer and how to use it. It does really help if you use something like that Sharpie trick so that you can really see the highs and lows. You know, the spots that stay dark, those are low because obviously they didn't get rubbed off. That's just finished with 80 grit on a DA. Like you could go a lot further than this, but I think that's as far as I'm gonna take that. That looks awesome to me. Uh, I am running out of time here. I will hand planish this maybe another day, but it is the same sort of deal and you've seen me do, do it before. So uh, maybe we'll just link a video in the description. I'll ask Christina if she doesn't mind linking uh, the video with the hammer and dolly techniques in it. And we'll, we'll do a little bit of planishing here. But uh, overall, I mean, I really enjoyed making this video for you guys because a lot of people ask me always about TIG welding sheet metal and how to do nice butt welds, that kind of thing. This is one of the trickiest things there is to learn is, is this right here. So I hope that this video simplified it for you a little bit just to help you understand kind of what it takes to get there and that welding is not the most important thing. Fit, fit is everything. Makes welding so much easier and makes planishing so much easier and makes so much less warpage. That is the takeaway. So I've been working hard, we've been doing this, and uh, I hope you guys love this video. I enjoyed making it for you. Me and Christina, we just wanna you know, express our gratitude. We do really enjoy being on YouTube and, uh, and having this community to speak with and to learn things from. We both, we really enjoy it. So thank you all for watching Make It Custom, and don't forget to like, click subscribe, hit notifications. We'll catch you on the next one. Have a great week, everybody.